Welcome to Google Santa Monica. And the authors at Google Team and Tech Talks at Google Team are pleased to welcome Fred Weary, who will be speaking to us on the Middle East and its current political climate. Fred Weary is a senior policy analyst at the RAND Corporation. His research focuses on Persian Gulf security, Iran, and the US policy in the Middle East. He spent 10 years as an active duty US Air Force officer focusing on Middle East affairs. He has had professional assignments throughout the Middle East, and since 2009, he's been an adjunct professor at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. We welcome Fred Weary. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for, the, for the kind introduction and also for the, uh, the invitation to be here today. Um, my topic is, is the Middle East and specifically the, the upheaval that's afflicting the region today, the, the Arab revolutions of 2011, the Great Arab Revolt, as they're called. We still don't really know the name of, of what's happening. It's so momentous. Uh, some have called it the, the Twitter revolution. It's still unfolding uh, really before our very eyes. Uh, so much so that some of my, my RAND colleagues have sort of joked that when we're doing media interviews on the Middle East, you need to keep CNN on in the background just so you don't get scooped. Uh, and I think we were talking in the elevator that it's, it's unfolding so quickly that by the, en the uh, end of our conversation today, it could be a, a new place altogether. Um, I think no one was really more surprised uh, about this upheaval than the, the regimes in the region, the governments um, in the region. The Middle East has long been thought of as sort of an exception to the rest of the world. Um, that the re While the rest of the world was undergoing democratization, political change, increased pluraliz uh, pluralism, uh, you saw the Middle East uh, really in a state of, of stagnation. Um, so a lot of our assumptions about this region have been, have been quickly overturned uh, by, by what has happened. And the regimes in the region really didn't even know what hit them. Uh, they barely felt the ground getting warm beneath them before they were sitting on top of, of volcanoes. And we'll get into that, uh, that surprise. Um, I wanted to divide my talk into, into really four parts. Um, first, some, some sort of broad brush observations about what really happened and why this is so significant. I've been studying the region since uh, 1992 when I went to Cairo uh, as an exchange student to study at the American University in Cairo. Um, and this is, this is really the most momentous uh, transformative time in the region, certainly since I've been studying and arguably uh, in the last uh, 50 years. So I want to try to, to capture that. Uh, then we'll go into why they started. Why did these revolts happen? What are the, the root causes? Why did they spread to some regions and not to others? Um, why did some countries escape unscathed? Uh, the implications for the United States. Uh, were we caught off guard? How well did we respond to this? What does it mean for our interests uh, in the region, in the Middle East, in this incredibly uh, important uh, part of the world? And finally, I want to conclude with a balance sheet. And I want to look at who's coming out on top, the winners and losers. Uh, and we're going to talk about the Islamic Republic of Iran, Al Qaeda, uh, the stability of, of Saudi Arabia, the larger uh, issues in the region that, that matter to the United States. Let's talk about why these, these revolutions are, are so signif uh, significant. Um, we really have to grapple with, with what's happened and the fact that observers and analysts are still trying to assign a name for, for these revolutions. Um, this is not really new. If you go back throughout history, anytime there's a revolution, it, it really represents a break from the status quo. Uh, it imparts a new vocabulary into political discourse that is often very unfamiliar. And it's often in hindsight that we see, okay, this revolution was uh, democratic, this revolution was Islamic, but that formation often takes uh, a very long time, and we can see that in the revolutions of 1789, 1848, 1979 in Iran, the 1989 with the, the uh, fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, so what we're looking at here is a very protracted process, that this could take a very long time. Uh, and it's important to remember also in revolutions that the initial victor, the people that often are, drive the revolution, that spark it, are not always the ones that come out on top. Revolutions have a way of being hijacked uh, by people that were not initially involved in it or were marginal uh, players. I think the, uh, the Arab revolutions of, of 2011 have really demolished uh, or changed three long-standing assumptions about this, this region. 
Uh, the first is what we can call the, the Arab exception. Uh, and this is what I was referring to earlier, that if you look at all the regions in the world, that somehow the Arab world is immune to the forces of political change that were happening elsewhere, specifically democratization. Um, you saw with the wave of uprisings that was transforming Eastern Europe uh, in the late 80s and 90s, the push for democratization in Latin America, even in Africa, democratization was taking hold. For some reason, the Arab world seemed to be immune to that. There were a lot of explanations for that, some of them rooted in, in social science, some of them, quite frankly, very stereotypical and, and racist. Some were saying there's something about Arab culture that makes them immune to democratization. Perhaps it's the religion of Islam uh, and the way it's practiced that, that is, is really a, a, an obstacle to democratization. The oil curse, the fact that this, this region has so much oil that that impedes uh, pluralistic forms of government. And perhaps colonialization, that, that the fact that these authoritarian regimes have persisted is because this region was under the thumb of European powers. And a corollary to that is that the U.S. is now the power in the region, and because we're propping up these despotic regimes, there's been no political change in the region. Uh, that's all ended. If it's not ended, it's been challenged in such a way that things will never, never be the same again. Um, the second issue is, is, the second change is what I can call the sort of Faustian bargain uh, that the people in the region endured for so long. And this is, uh, particularly in these, in these oil-rich countries, the idea that they would surrender their personal liberty, surrender a voice in governance in exchange for stability and economic growth. Uh, for a variety of reasons that I'll get into, that, that has changed. Much of it has to do with the influx of social media and technology, uh, but it also has to do with sort of the perfect storm conditions of uh, economic stagnation, uh, the decline and the ability of these regimes to meet the expectations of their people. Um, so that has changed and nothing can go back uh, to the way it was. Uh, and third is that the cachet or the idea of democratization is, is back in fashion uh, in the Middle East. It's important to remember that after 2001, after the 9-11 attacks, uh, the United States really uh, began a push to get the regimes in the Arab world to clean up their affairs, to democratize, to reform. There was this notion that political reform was the antidote to terrorism, uh, the so-called drain the swamp idea, um, that we cared about what happened in, in Egypt and Saudi Arabia because it, it spawned terrorism that affected us. Um, so there was this big push uh, to get reform going. Uh, the problem in the region uh, was that that was seen as being imposed from the outside. Um, and democratization really has to come from the bottom up. It has to come uh, from the grassroots. It has to be incremental. Uh, the other problem with, with democratization, and opinion polls really, really support this, and I was doing field work uh, in the region, uh, is that people associated it with the U.S. Uh, invasion of Iraq, that this was a case of a democracy forcibly imposed on another country prematurely, uh, and that this led to the cycle of, of sectarian violence in the Civil War that, that afflicted uh, Iraq. Uh, that has all changed now because people took matters into their own hands. This was truly uh, orchestrated from the ground up by everyday Egyptians, Tunisians. Um, this, certainly there was assistance from the outside. We know that the United States had NGOs that were, that were uh, equipping and training many of these activists in, in networking and communication. Certainly the role of social media uh, played an important role, but ultimately people took things uh, into, their, into their own hand. Let's talk about why, why it spread, uh, what, what really caused uh, these re uh, revolts. Um, first of all, I think we need to temper some of our assumptions about technology and, and social media. Um, and I'll, I'll say this freely to this, this audience, it's often been called the, the Twitter revolution, the Facebook revolution. Um, Twitter didn't make the revolution, people did. I think these technologies are enablers, they're amplifiers, but they're not the drivers of, of the revolution. We can talk about this later. What are the real structural roots of what was happening? Uh, in a lot of these countries, and, and we'll get into some economics here, you had this witch's brew, this perfect storm of three conditions. A low GDP, economic stagnation, a low median age, in other words, a very youthful population uh, that had rising expectations that in many cases was increasingly educated, 
uh, and high unemployment. In tandem with this, you had rising uh, food prices, falling wages, increased urbanization, uh, and the old system of the regimes being able to meet the expectations of their people uh, was failing. Now, it's often, uh, th these revolutions have often been thought of as sort of a wave uh, that, the, that the Arab world is, is experiencing a cohesive uh, wave of, of democratization. Certainly, there's communication between the, the activists in these countries. We know this from Tunisia and Egypt. But we really have to take a look at this, what's happening country by country. Uh, each country uh, is very different. Uh, and this really, I think, helps explain why it spread to some countries and not to others. Specifically, we need to look at this concept of legitimacy. How do people see the ruler that they're ruled over? Not necessarily is he, is he democratic, does he respond to their voice, but is he respected? Um, does he have the respect of key segments of the population, tribes, the military? Is he able to perhaps buy that respect? Um, has his tribe intermarried with other tribes? We find this in places like uh, Morocco, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia, which by no means are, are populist democratic places, but they've emerged relatively unscathed from these revolts because of this idea of the, that the ruler is legitimate. Uh, that is not the case uh, in places like, obviously, Libya, Tunisia, Bahrain, where you have a monarchy that's seen as incredibly illegitimate and corrupt and ruling over a majority Shia population. So again, we need to look at this um, uh, at a case-by-case uh, basis. Um, if you look at what happened uh, in each country and how it started and spread, there were certain population segments that allied themselves with the, with the uh, protesters, uh, and this really impacted uh, the extent of the, of the revolt. In Tunisia, it started out in the capital. It quickly spread to rural areas. There was a strong labor dimension. The military stood aside, which was the key decisive uh, factor in this, in this uh, revolt. But the military is not really playing a decisive role. In Egypt, this was a student-led uh, youth revolt. Uh, but it was also very broad-based and communal. It was very disciplined, which is another uh, key factor here. The, the, the Egyptians did not respond to the provocations uh, of the regime uh, to, for them to use violence. Uh, and the decisive factor here was the military. The military had its own identity. The military said, our interests are better served by allying ourselves with, with the student protesters. Uh, on the other uh, spectrum, we have what appear to be not simply rebellions, but civil wars going on. Uh, and here we're talking about uh, Yemen uh, and Libya. Yemen has always been bordering on a failed state. The oppositionists are sort of a shaky constellation of secessionists from the south, Houthi rebellions in the north, Al-Qaeda, tribes. Uh, Libya, what we're seeing is a real fragmentation of the country between the east and the west. Um, so the challenges of each country of, of rebuilding and recovering from, from these rebellions will be different. Uh, in places like Egypt, there's a strong tradition of civil society. People are, are acquainted with how to organize themselves uh, and debate issues. Uh, there are opposition movements. So the transition, I think, will be, will be if not easier, uh, it will be more, more stable. In Libya, it's, we're going to be starting from the ground up. Libya was ruled over uh, by Gaddafi for 42 years. There was no civil society. There were no institutions. People just simply don't have the, the ability to organize themselves. Um, let's talk a brief about, real briefly about US, US policy. Um, did we see this coming? US intelligence analysts have often been fa uh, faulted for, for failing to predict uh, these momentous changes in the region, going all the way back to the fall of the Shah in 79. Um, I think it's a bit unfair. It's holding them to, to a really high standard because the, the actual participants in these dramatic events didn't even realize it was happening until they were caught up to, into it. Things happened on an hourly basis. Uh, I was in Libya uh, right up before the revolt started until the 17th, uh, and it was very difficult to get a sense of, of what was happening because the people themselves were not even organizing. It was so spontaneous. The regime certainly didn't, didn't think uh, it would happen. The key catalyst in, in a lot of these revolts, why they spread, is that there's some galvanizing event, and sometimes this is an overreaction by the regime. The regime's security forces go in, they respond harshly, uh, they kill protesters, and suddenly that becomes a rallying cry. Uh, cry. 
and the, the, the real face of the regime is unmasked and the regime loses legitimacy very quickly and population segments quickly join uh, the, the rebellion. Obviously in Tunisia, the very poignant, tragic story of the fruit seller who, who set himself on fire became the, the catalyzing event. Uh, in Egypt, there was the death of a, of a very popular blogger at the hands of security forces. In Libya, it was a massacre of, of protesters in Benghazi, in the city of Benghazi on the 15th of February, the arrest of a lawyer that, that quickly sparked this, uh, this rebellion. Uh, and in Bahrain on the 17th of February, the regime went in and killed seven protesters in Pearl Square, uh, and that really uh, galvanized the revolt. Another key decisive factor that we often have, a sen have difficulty getting a sense of is the loyalty of the militaries in these countries. For obvious reasons, militaries in these countries have a vested interest in keeping their cards close to their chest. They, they, they obviously want to present the appearance that they're loyal to the regime, but beneath the surface they have their own uh, grievances. And when the military uh, changes sides, it happens very, very quickly. And we saw that uh, obviously in Egypt, and we saw segments of the military defect uh, in, in, uh, in Libya. Let's talk about uh, winners and losers in these, in these revolts. Um, who's, who's coming out on top and, and what does it mean? Obviously when this first started there was, there was a lot of euphoria uh, in the press that this was uh, the shaking off of, of despotism in, in the region, that this was a wave of, of democratization. Uh, we, need to, we need to be careful about this for the reasons that I mentioned, that revolutions tend to be very protracted and bloody. There's a tendency for groups to hijack them. There's also a tendency for backsliding, that they can, they can backslide, that authoritarianism can, can rear its ugly head uh, again. Uh, we're seeing some, some discomforting hints of that uh, in these, in these current, uh, current revolutions. Obviously in Egypt, the role of the military is, is a key concern. The military has a vested interest uh, in, in preventing real market liberalization in a private economy. They've got their own, uh, own interests at stake. The Islamists, the Muslim Brotherhood that took part uh, in, in the Egyptian revolutions are certainly no Jeff Jeffersonian uh, Democrats. Uh, we'll get into them later. Uh, but there's a real concern that, uh, that their weight uh, could carry the day and that these more secular liberal voices could, uh, could fall by the wayside. And finally, any time you shake up a system like Gaddafi's Libya, which I've, I've been there and it was a very, very stable place. No crime. There was very little uh, you know, violence of any sort, sectarian, ethnic, tribal. I mean, he kept a lid on what was happening there. Any time you take that lid off uh, you, in some of these countries, you've opened, opened a potential Pandora's box. Um, so you're looking at the possibility of, of real civil war and warlordism uh, in places like Yemen and, and Libya. What about the, the regional winners uh, in, this, in this revolt? I mean, we've shaken up, the, the, the region has shaken itself. Um, these Arab states are changing at a, at a remarkable pace. But the real elephant in the room, the real country that is, has preoccupied us uh, because of its quest for, for nuclear weapons and its uh, and its influence in the region is the Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, and many people, many observers are arguing that the Arab revolts represent a victory for Iran. Why? Because the long-standing pillars uh, that we've depended on in the region to balance Iran, like Mubarak's Egypt, are, are being shaken. And the argument is that as these, re as these regimes become more pluralistic, as, they are, as their people get more of a voice, Iran will have more openings to influence the political growth of these countries, their political uh, direction. We see this certainly in, in Bahrain, in the island kingdom of Bahrain, uh, which is ruled over by a Sunni monarchy, but is 70% Shia. Uh, Iran is often thought to have uh, influence over these Shia, but in many cases this is exaggerated. But the issue of Iran getting greater influence is a real danger uh, in this country if the, if the current uh, crackdown uh, continues, which could radicalize a lot of the, the Shia uh, opposition. Um, I'm going to argue for, for a different interpretation, that Iran is actually coming out not looking that good uh, after these, these, these Arab revolts. Why is that? If you look at what Iran has long been selling in the region, the real appeal 
of, of Iran, it's a negative for, form of influence. Uh, Iran has always been looked at with a degree of admiration by Arab publics because it's standing up to the West, because it's supporting the Palestinians. But would any Arab really want to live under the Iranian style of rule, under the Islamic uh, Republic's political system? Um, it's simply not an appealing model. And it's not an appealing model, especially today, to the youth who gathered in Tahrir Square in Egypt, who put their lives at risk for democratization, while Iran is cracking down on its own uh, population. There's a great deal of, of hypocrisy here while Iran is suppressing its own democratic uh, uprising. As uh, Admiral Mullen said, the only hand that Iran has ha had in these Arab uprisings is the one that it has used to keep its own population down. So I think the, the true nature of the Islamic Republic is really being exposed uh, in, this, uh, in these uprisings. What about Saudi Arabia? Uh, this is a country that, that matters to us uh, enormously uh, for a variety of reasons. Oil, it's been a long-standing pillar of our strategy in the Cold War and now against the Islamic Republic of Iran. Um, people have been making predictions and prophecies about the fall of the Al Saud for, for a long time. This is a very aging uh, gerontocracy ruled over by, by, uh, by an aging king. Remarkably, this regime has been able to stay in power. Uh, why is that? Because partly of the oil wealth, they've been able to buy off dissent. And in the wake of these uprisings, you saw King Abdullah earmark about $35 million uh, to dispense to the population to try to, to, try to buy off uh, dissent. The other strategy that the Al Saud have been using is to, to keep the, the opposition divided, to play off different factions against the other, to really present the royal family, the Al Saud, as the glue that's holding the country together. In other words, you may not really like the regime, the, the rule, but what's worse is going to be far, far, uh, what follows us could be far, far worse. Um, so right now we're seeing, we're seeing the Al Saud weather this, uh, but that's not to say that there's some very disconcerting signs uh, under, the, under the surface. The other, um, the other player in, these, in this drama is the Islamists. Uh, certainly the Muslim Brotherhood uh, in Egypt. Uh, will they come out on top? I think in the new governments that form in the region, there will be an Islamist dimension, and the U.S. has to get used to this. The U.S. has to get ready to live with this. Um, obviously, in politics, Islamism may be an illiberal force, uh, a force that is, is in some instances opposed to, to American values. Islamists, when they come to power in the Middle East, may ask for some distancing of cooperation with the United States on the Arab-Israeli issue, on counterterrorism, uh, especially on counterterrorism, because many of these Islamists were jailed by the very same security services uh, that has helped the United States uh, against al-Qaeda. That said, I think um, what happens, and this is, this is a real uh, debate among political scientists, but it's, it's a political phenomena that Islamists, when they're in opposition, tend to be very radical, extremists, maximalists in their demands. But once they come into parliament, once they come into power, it has a moderating effect because politics is about cutting deals uh, and making compromises. So we may see more pragmatism and moderation when I Islamists are included in governments in, in the region. The counter, however, is, 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 per is perhaps more dangerous uh, than, than including them. If they're not included in government, if we return to the old style of repression, this could become fertile recruiting ground for al-Qaeda. It could become a, a pool of, of, of radicalization. This leads me to my, my conclusion um, about what the, what the revolutions are doing to al-Qaeda. Obviously, there's an argument that any time there's a shakeup in this region, al-Qaeda can step in and exploit things. But I think in terms of the, the larger narrative that, that al-Qaeda has been selling in the region, um, these revolts have, have dealt a devastating blow. And you've actually seen this in the silence, the initial silence that al-Qaeda had uh, right after the revolts. They were really caught off guard. They didn't know how to, how to respond to the, these revol revolts. What are the two main arguments that al-Qaeda has been using in the region that it's selling? Uh, the first is that the only way to overthrow regimes in the Arab world is by jihad, by force. And the second is that the United States is, is really propping up these regimes and that the United States will never 
uh, relinquish its support uh, for the re these regimes. Both those arguments have been demolished uh, in, in these revolutions. People power has, has shown its true, uh, its true potential, and the U.S. has sided with the forces of, of popular change uh, in the region. The greatest risk, and this is, this is true of any revolution, when they, when they occur and when they consolidate, there's a period uh, of vulnerability. Expectations have, have, have risen. Um, and I think the, the real risk is if these new regimes that come to the fore are unable to meet uh, the demands of their people, if certain segments are excluded, particularly on the economic front. If, if, there's, if there's stagnation, if people's lives are not visibly improved, there could be backsliding. There could be a window for uh, for radicalization. The key argument here, and I'll close with this, is the need for what I can call strategic patience, both from the U.S. and by the people in the region, that this will be a long process um, for these, these revolutions uh, to play out. Um, this could be a problem because the very youthful energy that, that propelled these revolutions in the first place in Egypt uh, does not always make for, um, for the virtue of, of patience. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll close and uh, open it up to uh, any questions. So, Thank you. Let's see if this works. We have questions. OK, I'm going to, Fred, you can just stay there, and sure, I'll yeah. pass this around. Thanks. Um, OK, so I have two things. Uh, one is, could you talk about the relation to Israel, like where is, how Israel fits into this and the relation? I mean, it's probably too early because uh, these revolutions are still going on, but sure. um, that's one thing. And then the second one is that I want to challenge a little bit what you said about um, that the perception that the U.S. has been propping up these regimes has been demolished because... Um, well, maybe they, I mean, I, I think they've been trying to prop them up, but they just didn't succeed. Right. And Obama just, uh, you know, you could see him wavering on how does he, what, how does he respond, for example, while the Egypt revolution was going on, a very close ally, mm -hmm. um, and first was very reluctant, you know, was arguing to uh, sort of have uh, Mubarak, you know, very slowly ease him out of power instead of, you know, completely siding with the protesters immediately. And um, so I, I could, I mean, I myself see it as, um, yeah, they've been trying to prop, it, prop them up. They just didn't succeed. Mm -hmm. And I think it really depends on now on how uh, will, you know, the perception of the U.S. and the re region, how will they continue uh, to act? And also, obviously, they're still... Uh, I would, yeah, I guess propping up uh, Saudi Arabia, right? So, sure. and, and the other big argument of Al-Qaeda is the presence of U.S. troops on the Arab Peninsula and so on, which yeah. is also still going on. No, those, those are very good points. I mean, starting with the, the first issue of Israel, I mean, again, this is, this is, this is the great unknown. Obviously, there are, there are voices of concern and alarm uh, in, in Israel because Mubarak was such a, a reliable partner in, in keeping the cold peace uh, and that the Muslim Brotherhood... Uh, has been so vociferous in, in opposing Israel, um, has these sort of, of moral and ideological links with, with Hamas. Um, so this is, this is a concern for, you know, for Israel. Um, that said, I do think um, you, you could see more continuity. I mean, certainly you could see some, some tension, um, some chilling of, of relations uh, between uh, you know, Egypt and, and you know, states like Jordan. But, the, the other argument is that um, many of the youth that are, that are taking to the streets in these, in these protests have been fed this diet by their regimes, that, that all their problems are because of Israel. Uh, and that's, that's a standard propaganda ploy in the, in the region. It's, it's a Zionist plot. You see it right now in Syria. It's a Zionist plot. You see it even in Saudi Arabia. It's a Zionist plot. Uh, I, they see right through that, and they're fed, of that, fed up with that. So presumably, if there's more public voice in the in the government, there could be a more, you know, moderate and pragmatic view toward uh, toward Israel, and that this could actually be um, be a good thing in terms of, of moving real, genuine uh, peace forward. Because you know, democracies democracies have this propensity to be uh, friendlier toward their their neighbors. Um, the the issue of of you know the is the U.S. still committed to the old system? Um, 
certainly, I mean, there's, there's grounds for al-Qaeda to, to, to accuse the U.S. of hypocrisy. The, the issue of Saudi Arabia is, is a, key, uh, a key issue. I mean, I'm frankly very concerned about uh, the United States role in Bahrain, uh, where there's, there's this repression going on and the U.S. is, is sort of gently uh, chastising the al-Khalifa but is not coming out uh, forcibly. Um, a huge, huge military base, obviously, and, and this, is, this goes to the, the balance of interests and priorities that the administration is confronted with in this region, and that's, that's not surprising. I mean, to demand consistency in world politics is, is a bit naive. I mean, everything is case by case, uh, but certainly does that give an argument to al-Qaeda? Sure. But, you know, U.S. policy in the Middle East has always been dominated by, by trade-offs, and which, which enemy are we willing to deal with at this time at the expense of, of another uh, interests. Um, I think it's just, it's simply a matter of, um, you know, how, how we frame this in, in public diplomacy. Um, I think our intervention uh, in Libya and the fact that there was this, this Arab consensus um, for the initial humanitarian intervention, that, that I think played out very well, uh, you know, in, in, the, um, in the Arab street. And then also, um, you know, the, the Arab public opinion is also watching the, the, the public opinion of the United States. Uh, and what you see in polls in the United States of Americans is that, by and large, many Americans see these, uh, these changes in the region as being a good thing for the people in the region and then also um, for the United States. So, yeah. uh, this is kind of a two-part question. I guess the first is that, in your opinion, when it came to invading Iraq, do you feel that there were actually legitimate um, there was sufficient evidence to speak to weapons of mass destruction, or was that really more just uh, all politicized and uh, sensationalized to give justification for that invasion? And then the second part is, when it comes to these interventions or invasions, doesn't the military, like any logical project, look toward an exit strategy and an end? And even though it may be very difficult to effectively predict a date and time, yet have, at least in that discussion, uh, there be some kind of a timeline for an exit? And at what point does it just seem to be more uh, a, a political decision when it becomes, you know, the people in the United States have less of an appetite to be involved in a particular region that you then see the government begin to make movement to take U.S. occupation out, and how much of it, of it is it truly uh, you know, the foreign policy of our country to try to implement democracy within a region? Okay, yeah, no, some, some very good points. The, uh, the issue of Iraq, uh, I, I genuinely believe that the, the leadership of our country believed uh, believed the intelligence that they saw, believed that, that Saddam Hussein was uh, developing or in possession of, of weapons of mass destruction. Uh, and, and you have to remember the, the great fear, uh, and this was still in the shadow of 9-11, of, of the great fear is that there would be this perfect storm of a rogue state, a state that was hostile to us, giving weapons of mass destruction uh, to a terrorist group like al-Qaeda. And, and this may seem you know, far-fetched in, in hindsight now that, now that we know there was nothing there. But I, I genuinely believe that the, the intelligence was, was the driver uh, and that the leadership thought they were acting in the, in the best interest of the country and there, there was not this spin, there was not a post facto justification of that. Certainly were there, were there other sort of unspoken motives uh, for, for the invasion? I think so, yeah. The, the idea that by overturning the Saddam regime, you could plant the seed of, of, of a democ democratic regime in the region that would, that would spur changes elsewhere uh, in the region. Obviously, that, that did not happen. Um, the, the issue of, of military interventions and, and timelines, um, certainly when, when militaries go into countries for a variety of, of, of reasons, whether it's uh, uh, to, you know, for humanitarian reasons, whether it's uh, to, to combat a hostile regime. There are stated military objectives. Uh, the military has to know that its, its forces are accomplishing the mission. There are, there are benchmarks. How do we know we're succeeding? Um, those benchmarks are not telegraphed often uh, to the public for, for a variety of reasons. And, and also, if, if you assign an actual uh, 
exit date, we're going to leave by this strategy, uh, by, this, uh, by this date, you've, you've empowered your adversary because the adversary simply has to wait you out. Um, and this, this is a real issue. Um, now, certainly, does, does public opinion uh, play, play a role here? Absolutely. I mean, the, the commander in chief is, is an elected official. He responds to public opinion. Uh, and, and there is a precedent where uh, we've gone in for a specific reason. The, the mission has expanded beyond the mandate. There's been more casualties, you know, that, that, that were initially expected. Uh, and, and the public just simply doesn't have, uh, have the appetite for that. And certainly our adversaries in, in, in their strat strategic thinking, they know that, that if you inflict casualties on, on American troops, that's their Achilles heel because the American public doesn't want to see its sons and daughters uh, being killed. It's what's called the so-called Somalia, uh, Somalia example, where the image of, of U.S. soldiers being dragged through the streets of Somalia prompted the U.S. to pull out because precisely of that, of that casualty dimension. Um, it, I think it also depends on how the goals are communicated uh, to the public by, by our leadership and that this is, this is in our national interest to do this. Talking about Libya, I don't think that this has um, perhaps been done as, as effectively as, as possible. The, the initial uh, impulse to go in uh, was humanitarian under the, under the legitimacy of this UN resolution to prevent the slaughter of, of Benghazi. Uh, but have we really established um, what we're looking for and how far we're willing to commit military forces uh, to achieve that, that goal? Um, I, don't, I don't think that's been clear. So. Okay, uh, yeah, I've got a question. A question, from the VC. A question for v from VC, go ahead. Okay, uh, so I have a question on the VC here. Uh, we can hear you, go ahead. Can you hear me? Where are you okay. at? Uh, we are in Mountain View. Okay, what's your question? Okay, yeah, so there are countries like uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan that are, not, that, are not, that are not doing any better than countries like Egypt. So why do you think the revolution has not spread beyond the Arab borders? I was reading an article somewhere that, that said that uh, the best true Arab country right now, uh, the country, Muslim country right now, is Iran probably. So why do you think the, the revolution has not spread beyond the Arab borders into Afghanistan, Pakistan, and all those countries? Right. Well, this, this really speaks to the, the nature of the, the Arab world, um, I think because you know, the, you know, Arabs as a people share a common consciousness, a, a common history, a common language. Uh, and throughout the history of this region, when, when there's an event that happens in one country, it tends to spread uh, or, or infect, as it were, other countries in the, uh, in the, in the Arab world. Uh, there, there's sort of an echo effect. Um, because the Arabs speak the same language, because of the role of media in conveying uh, these ideas and conveying these images, um, you know. So, so could these revolutions have an impact beyond the the Arab world? Absolutely. I mean, I think um, there were reports that that uh, that the government of Zimbabwe was concerned about its citizen watching watching the uh, the Tunisian uprisings. China has taken steps to to sort of clamp down on on media in the wake of these uprisings. Um, the 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 issue of Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, I mean, you could argue this is this is already going on in these countries. I mean, the, you know, how much how much more revolution can you see? I mean, you're seeing in, uh, insurgencies in in these countries all, already. Um, so so they're not really, you know, ripe for a rebellion against, uh, uh, you know, a, de a despotic uh, authoritarian regime. Because in the case of Afghanistan, there really isn't one. There's there's a government that's barely holding on to power. Uh, and in the case of Pakistan, I think you, I mean you are seeing that in certain uh, in certain areas. Um, but again, I really want to emphasize that this, the, the nature of, of Arabism as an idea and its role in spreading, um, uh, spreading events is, is very important to understand this region. Uh, yeah, I have a two-part question. Uh, the first would be, um, could, maybe these are a little more detailed, but could you speak to the, um, the referendum in Egypt and why, despite 
uh, the organizers of the revolution having, you know, opinions against it and encouraging people to vote against it is still passed by over 70 percent. And I'm sure that the Muslim Brotherhood's support of it had something to do with that. And then secondly, could you speak to the emergence of the Salafi movement in Egypt as uh, a kind of distinct but still Islamist voice and how that may or may not play out um, in Egyptian politics? Yeah, no, the, the issue of, of Salafism is something that was, has been growing in, in Egypt um, for quite a while, and in fact, uh, really across the region. Um, why is that? I, again, one, one explanation is, is you know, Saudi funding, that a lot of it is, is attributed to Saudi influence. The Saudis are, are going around and, and proselytizing, funding Salafi you know, charities in places like Jordan, uh, Lebanon, Egypt. Um, the, the, the flip side of that is, is a lot of people um, have become you know, youth that would normally be, draw, been, be drawn to the Muslim Brotherhood or other Islamist strains are, are disenchanted with those those currents, and they find something very appealing um, about Salafism. Um, it, it offers a sort of structure and a hierarchy uh, that, that they find appealing. Uh, my sense is that, you know, as, as a real political player in, 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 uh, in Egypt, the Salafi movement is, is, I think, still in a nascent phase. I mean, Salafis by nature, uh, if you look at their actual doctrine, they, they tend to abhor political participation. And, and you look at places like Saudi Arabia, those that do participate in politics, they've got to be very careful in how they justify that doctrinally. And many of them are, um, are, uh, you know, are criticized for that. So, yeah. uh, Question about um, economics. So yeah. for Egypt, um, one thing that you briefly mentioned and something I've been thinking about is I, I guess I didn't really realize how much uh, control the Egyptian military has over the economy. Um, and so I guess my question is, um, will uh, economics, uh, will fixing uh, Egypt and sort of like making greater prosperity for all, greater p political participation and so on, what's, how, how much of that is involved in sort of making a better, more equitable uh, system with regard to economy? And how much? And what does the military have to do with that? No, I mean this. This is the key issue. The military is going to have to surrender some of its its prerogatives, some of its its interests. Um, you know, much of much of the wealth was was embodied in the in the persona and the figure of, of Hosni Mubarak and, and his own patronage system, um, and that's that's the real target of, of the ire of, of the people. Um, the military, you know, I think. The United States has a great deal of, of leverage over the U.S. military. I think foreign aid um, can can be used uh, as an incentive to um, to liberalize the market and encourage uh, private economy. But this is the real. I mean, this is absolutely it. And and some people are saying what's going to happen is the the military will will push for you know political reform uh, as sort of a distraction that they want to keep things focused on politics while keeping keeping a very iron. Uh, thumb on, on the, the economy, um, so. Uh, a VC question? Can you hear us? Yeah, go ahead. Um, thank you very much for the insightful talk. Um, so one of the things that has been, uh, that I've been thinking about is the com uh, comparison between Egypt and Pakistan. Um, there are lots of similarities, like both uh, countries have a weak civil society, um, military with significant uh, investment in, uh, um, in economics, and you know that's going to be affected by um, emerging democracy, things like that. So, and yet, I mean, um, decidedly, Pakistan is a kind of a mixed bag when it comes to um, how it has fared as a democracy. So, what do you think is going to happen in Egypt? Do you think Egypt has a better pros has better prospects than Pakistan? Maybe, you know, uh, given very similar circumstances. Right, right. I think I think some key differentiating factors is is um, the the homogeneity of society in in Egypt, um, in that you don't have these these rural areas like you do in, in Pakistan, the Baluch, you don't have these aggrieved population segments, tribal areas um, that are just so so beyond the, the, the pale of the government and, and so resentful of, of their marginalization. Um, Egypt is, is largely an urban um, society. Um, much of this revolt happened in the urban areas. 
Um, there is a tradition, I mean, going back to, you know, the 50s and 60s and, and perhaps even earlier of political organization and political maturity. And, and you have, um, you had a tradition of a parliament, you had a constitution. Um, and, and I think what is so remarkable uh, about this, this revolt uh, and what does bode well for uh, a successful democratic uh, tr uh, transition is the cooperation that you saw among uh, these different different population segments, um, you know, secularists, Islamists, students, workers. Um, this this is genuinely a popular, um, you know, a popular uprising. I just don't think you're seeing that sort of, of coordination uh, in in uh, Pakistan. And you know, the fact that the the Egyptians ha were able to organize themselves, I think, you know, does does is, is grounds for a degree of, of optimism. So. So you mentioned the sort of period of vulnerability that all of these areas right. are going to be going through. Obviously, there's going to be an opportunity or you know, sort of temptation for the US and the West in general to help shape how that plays out. But at the same time, as you talked about, a lot of the sort of anti-US or anti-West narrative in that region is about us sort of controlling governments, propping up governments. So how do you see us sort of navigating that balance of assisting versus being perceived as controlling. Absolutely. No, that's that's a great point. I mean, the it's the it's the kiss of death for any, you know, politician in the region, uh, especially uh, you know, a figure that comes into office an opposition figure to be branded as a as a US puppet or to have the the stench of the US on him. And so we we want to be very careful about the the type of support that we we inject into this into this unfolding drama. Uh, the key way to do this, um, and, and, it, and this goes back to my earlier point about the assistance that was done before this all started, is through uh, non-official channels, NGOs. Um, so groups like NDI, IRI, um, groups that, that are involved in you know, training citizens in how to be good Democrats in the skills of, of voting, uh, of political participation. I mean, when I was going through the region in places like you know, Egypt, uh, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, they all spoke approvingly of, of these programs. Did, were they always efficient? Were there, was there, you know, bureaucratic problems? Certainly. But, but this, was, this was seen as, as a genuine, you know, gesture by the United States to, to help the region from the ground up. Um, simply picking a leader or picking an opposition figure, trying to pick a winner in this drama and backing him, I think that would be, that would be a real mistake. And I think that's why we're being so careful right now with the Libyan opposition, because we just don't know who they are. And there's a lot of guys standing up saying, uh, you know, pick me, I, you know, support me. We just don't know if they have the real uh, credibility of, of the people. And we learned this lesson uh, in, the, uh, in the invasion of Iraq with the Iraqi National Council, that a lot of times in these countries, uh, you know, when there's a change of regime, you have exiles who have contacts with the West and the US. They come in, but they don't enjoy the credibility of the, of the people because they've been out of power. Uh, for so long. So we have to tread very carefully, and your point is, is absolutely right. Yeah. Oh, okay, uh, let's take uh, two more questions. Uh, there's one back here, and then we'll go forward. There. Sure. When it comes to the Middle East, um, uh, when we talk about vital to U.S. interest, can you explain what that means to us as a country? Because it just seems that, you know, I mean, we with the Iraq and then in all of our, the military interventions, or, or even the U.S. government interventions, but we are endeavoring to promote democracy, but yet, what is the benefit that we as American citizens or that the country gets in the broader sense? It seems like we have to pay the expense of these military interventions, and then it, it, we don't get any break in the price of oil coming to us. Right. So I'm I just trying to reconcile how we find and we say that certain things are vital to our U.S. interest in the Middle East when it comes down to oil in which we ultimately seem to get no benefit from. Sure, sure. I mean, again, going back through history, the, the, the vital interest of the U.S. in, in, in this part of the world was uh, preserving the status quo and, and seeing regimes remain as they are. Uh, this was true during the Cold War when we wanted to use this region as, as a buffer to prevent the Soviets uh, from coming in to protect oil supplies. Um, it was true, it's true when we talk about our struggle with the uh, Islamic Republic of, of Iran, we see these status quo regimes as, as, as being pillars. 
Um, the, the, the issue now is that our definition of, of national interest uh, is, is rapidly changing. The first blow to it, I think, was, was really 9-11, um, where the devil's bargain that we made with a lot of these regimes about you know, our national interest being tied to their stability and their you know, existence as authoritarian regimes, um, that came under fire because you know, the, the terrorists were spawned from Saudi Arabia in this climate of, of repression. And so suddenly we changed it, our, our definition. And it is in our interest to, to promote political change in the region and greater democratization, albeit in a very measured and calibrated manner. So it's, it's, um, it's stable. Um, you know, I think, I think um, in terms of your point about, about military interventions, I mean, I think, I think the US has been correctly chastened by the Iraq experience that it is not in our national interest to go about remaking the world in our image uh, or to even go about slaying monsters. There's plenty of despotic regimes out there uh, and, and politics is the art of, of you know, learning to deal with them, applying other non-military pressures to change them. Um, and certainly I think the, the current administration recognizes that because our troops are, are stretched so thin in Afghanistan and Iraq and because of the, the tremendous damage that the Iraq war caused to our credibility and moral legitimacy in the Middle East. Uh, and this is, I can't emphasize this enough, going around the region during the height of the Iraq War, 2006, 2008, uh, enormous. So we've, we've, you know, we've recognized that, that we can't uh, be doing that. Um, the, the issue of, of Libya was, was sort of a different case and it, it may represent a, a different model, sort of pragmatic idealism that we went in under uh, a genuine humanitarian impulse that there was a multilateral framework for doing that, the United Nations, NATO, uh, and we did that now, we're stepping back. So we're not, we're not getting into the sort of quicksand that you talk about with these, with these military interventions that suck up our resource. So I think we've, we've learned and our definition of, of national interest is, is becoming a more sophisticated one. Yeah. Um, well, so uh, um, the, the easy form is who's NDI and IRI that you've mentioned, but more broadly, um, uh, in terms of sort of retail level NGOs that are um, effectively engaging to uh, um, not to, to make more American these places, but to make um, uh, the Middle East develop in a good way. Right. Um, who, who's effective? Because I mean, I've seen USAID uh, projects that are kind of overblown and bombed out and kind of pathetic looking. And I've, seen, I've talked to people in Morocco who just speak glowingly of the Peace Corps. So, you know, there's, there's a way of doing it well and there's a way of not. Who, who, who does do this well specifically where technologists like us could uh, um, be involved? Yeah, absolutely. No, it's, it's um, you know, the, it, first of all, national, it's National Democratic Institute, International Republic Institute. Um, the, the issue of governments trying to do what private sector by nature does better is, is always a problem. And bureaucracies simply are, are ill-equipped to do certain tasks. And you're absolutely right. I think many of these, these large-scale you know, uh, projects in Afghanistan, we know this from, from studies of you know, where did the money go, was it completed on time, and they're looking at it. The larger the project, the more grandiose the ambition, the more likely it will fail. So the, the argument is uh, smaller is better, uh, more local is better, um, empowering these local local NGOs, training them to do the job, um, the job for you. Um, you know, I, I absolutely think there's there's a role for for private sector here. Um, you know, the 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 real complaint that I heard um, from from a lot of reformists and activists in the region was the tremendous bureaucracy that they had to to deal with. Um, from from the United States government in these in these programs and, and the lag time the the the, pro, the long elongated process that, that was taking place, you know so so absolutely I mean it, greater exchanges between the technology sector, um, you know as we saw with with Syria with you know in, in Jordan you're seeing this, um, I think this is absolutely the way to, the way to go um, and I think I think the current administration uh, recognizes that. All right, with that, uh, thank you very much, Fred, for coming and sharing your expertise. Sure, thank you.